Welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Rhiannon and I work for the Colleges of Science and Engineering. Um, following on from International Women's Day on the 8th of March um, and a month of celebrating achievements of women, I am delighted to host tonight's discussion panel, What Does the Future Hold for Women in Engineering? And as you can see, we've got a fabulous uh, room full of women, which are our students, um, our lecturers, and our alumni at Swansea University. Um, we're going to have, it's going to take about 50, 50 minutes this session, because we've got quite a lot of uh, topics to discuss. If you have a look at the bottom of your screens, there is a Q&A button, um, and we will have time at the end of the webinar for questions. So throughout the session, please feel free to type in uh, to the Q&A your question. And if it's for a particular panelist, please uh, pop their name uh, in, in, into the Q&A. So what we're going to do to begin with, I'm going to ask all of our panelists to introduce themselves and give a very short snippet um, about what, what they're doing and uh, a little bit about themselves. So um, I'm going to start with Elaine. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, so my name is Elaine Crooks. I'm a professor of maths here in Swansea and I'm also currently head of maths. And I've been in Swansea since 2007. Uh, in the past, I first studied for a joint degree in maths and physics, then I moved towards mathematics for my PhD. And yeah, have, have ended up here after a few places in between. So. Brilliant, thank you. Now I'm just gonna go around uh, my, my grid. So Nathando, do you want to Go next. Yes, um, so I'm Natanjo. I am currently on my, I'm on my placement at Lloyds Banking Group as a software and data engineer. Um, I've been here for seven months. I just have three more months to go now. Fantastic. Uh, Casey? Hello, um, I'm Casey and I'm a lecturer in the computer science department. I'm also um, one of the program directors for uh, one of the programs within the department, the degree apprenticeship. And I, like many of the others here, went to Swansea University as well, graduated in 2017, um, did a year in industry and then came back and have been teaching ever since. So they can't get rid of me yet. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Runao? Um, hi, hello. I'm Runal Deshmukh. I'm a Swansea alum alumni and uh, I've been a uh, an aerospace engineer for the last six years. I work for Airbus uh, since I graduated. So I've been working there as a configuration manager uh, for the AP20 XLR. Fantastic. Uh, Reem, over to you. Hi, I'm Reem. Um, I studied civil engineering. I graduated in 2014. Uh, I'm very good friends with Murnell. We met in uni, actually. <laughs> and um, I've been working in civil engineering. I've been working in HR. I worked a little bit everywhere. I moved around countries quite a lot. I'm based in Spain now. And I, today I was actually my first day uh, working in an IT company. So. Oh, well, congratulations <laughs> off for your first day. And thank you thank so you. much for uh, for coming uh, and doing the session with us. Um, okay, I've got Victoria next. Hi, uh, my name is Victoria. I'm a current third year student, engineering doctorate student, uh, studying corrosion within the materials engineering department. My industrial sponsor is BASF Chemicals. So it's uh, one of the largest chemical companies in the world based in Germany. Wow, thank you. Um, Patricia? Hi, uh, I'm Patricia. Uh, I'm Associate Professor for Program Enhancement and Development. So I look after some of the new programmes that we're bringing in, in engineering. And I'm also Programme Director for Engineering BN, which is uh, a, an integrated engineering degree. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, Meredith? Hi, uh, so my name's Meredith and I graduated last year uh, with a first in mathematics and I'm now currently doing a PGC in mathematics. Um, so I came to Swansea about four years ago and I've loved it ever since, just like everyone else, um, not wanting to leave. Um, so yeah. 
Brilliant, thank you. And just for um, the participants, if you don't know, a PGCSE is a uh, teaching qualification. And then finally, over to the other Rhiannon. <laughs> Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Rhiannon. I'm a fourth year mechanical engineering student. Um, I'm in my final year of the MEng programme and I've just accepted a graduate mechanical and uh, mechanical manufacturing scheme with Renishaw. Fantastic. And um, we've got two others, Chloe and Lauren, who are, are helping us out with IT support just in case anything goes wrong. Right, so um, I'm going to kick off with our first question, which I'm going to put towards Patricia and Elaine. Um, what inspired you to go into a career in STEM? Should I start? Oh. Um, so I grew up in Essex, other side, even over in England. And um, we used to go visit my relatives who lived in Kent. So we used to have to go under the tunnel between Essex and Kent and when I was growing up they were building the QE2 bridge actually across the river and I was just amazed by this incredible structure it was huge it was really impressive there was always lots of activity in the building site and as that bridge kind of um, was being developed and being built I was just always nagging my parents and asking them well how are they doing that how does that crane work what's happened to that piece there uh, and just little things like I used to take my bike <laughs> when I was a teenager and I couldn't put that together again and I had to sort of figure out how to put that together again and teach myself how it worked. Um, so just a curiosity really about how things worked and how things are put together and how things are made. And then at school I was directed by a careers advisor to say well consider engineering. He was a civil engineer and he was my maths teacher and he uh, talked me through like what the connections are between what, what I was learning in the class and, and careers that I could go into. So I think it's probably down to him, really, because he's the one who, who put civil engineering on, on the map. Because though I knew I loved bridges and I liked making things, I hadn't, until that point, really connected it to engineering. And, yeah, and that was really, yeah, that made a big difference. And then, then, then I was excited about that. I, I think that's the case for many students, um, having that curiosity, but not really knowing what type of subject it is. So yeah, brilliant. Um, Elaine, what about you? You're, uh, you're, as you said, you studied maths and physics. What inspired you to study those subjects? Well, I think, you know, when I was at school, I liked lots of things actually. You know, I really quite liked history and French as well as maths and physics, but maths and physics were the things that where I really felt myself. And it was just the natural thing for me then to go into. And my mother is a scientist as well, actually, of a different kind. So she was a biochemist. And so there was kind of um, a clear role model. It was just a completely normal, natural thing to do. And so, uh, yeah, I, I went and did a, a first degree in maths and physics. And then I was having so much fun that I just kept doing it. And that's how I ended up where I am now. Fantastic. And you are, of course, Professor of Mathematics. So I wanted to ask you if you came across any barriers when you were looking to become a professor um, or do you have any observations about a female becoming a professor? Well, I mean, first thing I would say is that I think I've been very lucky because I don't think I've had really big barriers. Um, but having said that, um, I think confidence is very important. And I think that, you know, at various steps along the way, you know, when I was sort of finishing my first degree and thinking about going on to do research, and then sort of once I had a PhD, going on to find another job. And then, you know, when you start, when you have an academic job, then, you know, when you're promoted to sort of higher levels and become a professor, at each step, there's sort of a question, you know, am I good enough and should I be doing this? And I think that various, at various points along the way, I've been encouraged. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, and another thing I think is networking. Um, so, you know, just being in a group of people. Um, so one thing I've been involved in in Swansea is in the organization of Soapbox Science, uh, which is a sort of outreach program uh, where um, people talk about, women talk about their research to passers-by. And, and I mean, I've been involved as a speaker um, this is a nationwide program and there's sort of a Swansea part of that. I've been involved as a speaker, um, but I've also been involved on the organisation side as a, in a group with other female academics. And that was very helpful for me. Um, it's just, you know, having people to talk to. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think probably all panelists and many of you uh, listening in today, it's confidence is, is really important for women as they progress through their careers, absolutely. especially in male dominated areas such as uh, maths and engineering. Um, I just quickly wanted to go back to Patricia um, because Patricia is our admissions tutor for one of our newer programmes, which is the interdisciplinary uh, engineering degree. And we're hoping this engineering degree is going to appeal to more female students. Do you want to explain, Patricia, a little bit why, why we think that? Yeah, this goes back to when I was doing my degree. So when I did my degree as an undergraduate, like I went into engineering because I wanted to help people and I wanted to, you know, gain a skill set then I could make a difference and, and improve lives I guess and I found that the degree was really focused on the nuts and bolts of engineering quite literally but so we learned about the maths and the mechanics and we learned about how to apply that but we weren't learning about context we weren't learning about how that connects to people how it connects to the planet so with this new engineering degree we're kind of embedding it much more strongly in kind of the impact the real world impact that engineering has so you can see from that that first year how your skill set is then informing and changing the world and some real world projects that your skill set can go towards and it, it's not just me there's a few people working on this project and we all have come from that same place and a lot of us are women yeah. and I don't know if that's a coincidence or, or why that's come about that way but there's quite a lot of research showing that uh, students going into STEM who are female who identify as female um, have a strong interest in the connection between science, technology, engineering, maths and, and the wider world. So with this engineering scheme, what we're trying to do is, is bring that context in. And it's been I feel really privileged actually to be in a position to, to make that change and to do that. Yeah, fantastic, because all of our engineering subjects and our science subjects do do that. They go to so solve problems that are happening in the world, but it's actually demonstrating that to our female audience. So mm -hmm. that's great, thanks. Um, we're gonna move on to Casey. So Casey, you obviously studied here um, and you're now a lecturer here. So you obviously are pretty keen on Swansea University. I wanted to ask you, before you get into, got into computer science, were you aware that it was quite a male dominated subject? And why do you think boys, there are more boys applying for computer science than girls? So my path into the subject is quite a strange one. I actually, when I applied to university, I wanted to be a French and Spanish teacher. So like Elaine, I had other interests. Um, and before I started then, I actually ended up switching subjects to computer science. And at the time I thought it was graphics. So I am, if you told me what computer science was, that it was programming and things like that, I would have been able to tell you it was a male dominated field, definitely. Um, and when I got into it, I was actually one of seven girls in my class of around 120. So it was very male dominated. But over the years, it has got a bit better. And I think that it's mostly male dominated because of the stereotypes that we are given as youngsters that like you see on TV. You are, I go, used to go to schools um, with outreach programs like techno camps. And if you ask uh, any student or child uh, in school, to draw a computer scientist. They have this picture of a crazy mad scientist in a white lab suit uh, who locks themselves in their basement and programs all day. And it's, it's just stereotype, I guess, what we think it is. But if you actually got the chance to study it at a younger age, first of all, and understand what it is, and as Patricia said, putting it into the context of where you can apply it, I think is really important. Because when I used to go to schools with the outreach programs and say what jobs they could get by being a computer scientist, it, it would blow the children's minds because they actually realize it's not just programming. There's a wide range of jobs you can get now just from having a computer science or any STEM subject degree. It's not just academia or just programming. Mm -hmm. It's everywhere. So there is a massive barrier of stereotypes that we need to break for our younger younger pupils and students. Yeah, I think if we get in there at the younger age, it'll definitely improve. And hopefully we'll have much more females in the field in the future. Yeah, fingers crossed. Um, thank you, that's really, uh, really interesting. So I'm gonna ask now Runel and Reem, who are buddies um, and obviously in industry. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what your experience has been like since you graduated and you're now working in industry? 
And I just wanted to follow that up with, you may know that there's a Women in Engineering Society within the university. Are those networks in industry, like Elaine talked about earlier, it's great to have female networks. Have you come across those networks um, in your current jobs? So yeah, Renelle? Yeah. Okay, so um, currently I'm Airbus. There's, um, I don't know, I'm maybe I'm ignorant, but there is, I've not come across many, uh, any groups of that are just women focused groups like that. But but then then again, like I've never uh, felt the need in a way because I've not not had, um, I've always had like a good experience and a good like friendship with my male colleagues and my female colleagues and everyone's been very supportive and, uh, and good. So uh, that's, that's one thing. And then, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you want to add anything Reem. Um, so uh, the first question was from graduation to now, what we've been doing. So in my case, uh, at first, I was in a civil engineer. Well, in a sorry, that's my son. <laughs> Another thing that we women have to do is still, even if we have a call, still have to babysit at the same time. Um, but yes, so the first uh, job I had was as a project manager in construction. In, uh <laughs> Give me two seconds. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, oh, um, I'll I'll talk about why. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Thank you, Munna. That's okay. So I've been uh, I joined as a subcontractor for a company called Arca after graduation, and um, it was because I was in industry as my year in industry with Airbus. So my manager from uh, the year in industry recommended me. To, to the ACA group and then uh, that's how I, I could work for Airbus, but not directly. And then, um, and then after that, I worked on several projects within Airbus in different departments, future projects, landing gear systems, configuration management. And eventually there, there was an opening and I, and I saw a good opportunity and I am working as a configuration manager since the last two years with Airbus. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, like the whole the whole way through, I was looking for I was looking for making good relationships and and challenges all the way. So uh, I think the main thing for me was growing as a as an engineer and as a person rather than uh, rather than focus on on gender equalities. Or uh, it is quite quite uh, equal, I'd say, in, in my industry, uh, the aerospace industry. Well, yeah. That's really yeah. positive to hear that in your experience that, you, you know, it, it is equal and you are, you know, you have the same um, level of uh, networking and respect between male and female colleagues, which is, which is fantastic to hear. I was just wondering, it's like senior level, is there good representation of females in Airbus or is it predominantly males that sort of chief exec and board level? No, no, there's quite a lot of uh, female executives. Uh, the, I think the CTO of Airbus right now is, is a female. Okay, fantastic, brilliant. Reem, how are you doing? <laughs> Oh, you're on mute. Oh, I think she needs to, <laughs> she needs to sort her son out. Um, Reem, we'll move on to the next question and then I'll, I'll come back to you if that's okay. Um, so this one's to Meredith and Victoria, who are- Sorry, on, I, uh, I had to oh. change rooms because it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, um, sorry. Yes, carry on. Do you want me to carry on? Go on then, yes. Okay, um, I was saying that I started working in construction and that's a really male dominated field. Um, and um, actually in that first company, I was part of two, two 
um, associations first, we actually, um, we set up the, the company was called Artelia. So the uh, Artelia Women's, um, not Women's Club, it was Artelia Women's Group. So we set that up, um, me with a couple of other women. And then there was another one called Urbanistas in London because that was where I was based. And it was also not only in construction, but it was in oil and gas. Uh, so it was the construction of, um, of Shell petrol stations. So I'm quite small. <laughs> and I used to, one of the things, uh, kind of barriers, that, which is a funny story, really, but it happened quite a lot of times, was I would go to the construction site. Uh, I was the project manager of the construction site. And obviously all these huge uh, electricians and builders and... Uh, <laughs> men all of them absolutely all of them uh would be there and i think in two or three occasions they wouldn't open the construction site doors because they just thought i was nosing around until i showed them my card um and then another time um there was no women's toilet it was just men's so you'd go to the construction site and, you know, the boxes that they would have. So those are kind of the funny stories I have from the construction experience I had. So that happened uh, a few times, but only my first year in the second one, then they got to know me and it was, it was fine. But uh, these things do happen. And it wasn't so long ago because this was in 2015. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's not that long ago. Uh, so there's quite a long way to go, right? Yeah. Uh, so I, in that case, I did feel kind of the need to to um, be in a sort of community of other women who were either in the same company or not. Uh, so that was really helpful to have that kind of support and other people who went through the same thing um, and to give you hope, really, of, of it moving forward. Um, and then for personal circumstances, well, I was in a, a graduate program. I, they sent me to France and I did structural engineering for a year. And then for personal reasons, I moved to Spain, uh, which is where I'm based now. And I went into mining, first into HR and then into mining. So another uh, very different field, still in engineering. Uh, but I've always been in the project management side, in the planning side. I was a global planner for their fleet of trucks. Uh, globally um, so that was uh, really interesting mm. uh, not many women there. actually in my team I was the only one um, but in our department I think we were two or three in that right. field as well it's not that common um, and in Spain it's the same there is an, as I mean the, the the ratio is still quite disproportionate but um, I have seen that in these uh, past years, the, the interns that were coming in were maybe 40, 60. You know, the ratio was, was much, much better. So that's, that's really good. And, um, but in the last couple of years, I did see that uh, in my experience, I didn't have such flagrant kind of... Um, uh, differences right mm -hmm. that you would see such as let's say you go to the construction site and there's no toilet for you or they wouldn't let you in and things like that so mm -hmm. I didn't I didn't that was that was it I, I only had that experience in, in the first in the first uh, job but afterwards it was fine I never had any problems really uh, I was very supported in my previous jobs I've moved around a bit as well in a different country so that you know, what Casey said is, is quite true. When you do study, I mean, I, I do have the crazy scientist hair, but um, <laughs> it kind of stops there. Um, it does give you so much more. If you just study civil engineering, it doesn't mean you have to stay in that field or the same with computer science, I'm sure, or maths or physics or anything. Um, and in my case, I've lived that, right, because I was in civil and construction and then in, in really technical and, and structural calcs. And then I even did a bit of consultancy in HR. Um, and then I went into mining and it was mostly in, in planning. And then now um, I was just saying today was my first day, et cetera. I'm in IT. Yeah, wow. I'm, I got into IT. So yeah. 
I mean, it goes back to Elaine's point about having confidence to be able to choose different um, professions. Um, exactly. But it's actually your point about, um, you know, having only male toilets. Um, <sighs> and it's good to see that that's changing. But I guess, you know, in the past, that kind of thing wasn't really thought about. I guess it's the same. I've got, a, you know, heard a story about um, a female project manager going to site and then not having size five uh, steel toe caps. Boots. Yes, I had to wait a month for mine, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it's good to hear that things are changing. So thank thank you for letting us know about your experiences. It's uh, it's great. Um, okay, so now I'm going to move on to um, Meredith and Victoria. And if you could let us know what it's like studying um, engineering and maths and what you hope your future careers will look like. We'll start with, yeah, Victoria, brilliant. Um, so I'm currently in my third year of my engineering doctorate, which is a four year course. And what it comprises of is during the first year, you are required to undergo a number of different modules. Mine was more in terms of a functional coatings application. So that's looking at coatings that can be applied to everyday objects. My doctorate is based on making coatings for cars and it's based around preventing corrosion. So a lot of the topics that I had studied during my first year were based on chemistry, which I studied as an undergraduate. So it was good to have that kind of baseline and sometimes a bit of a refreshment because I hadn't studied chemistry um, for a little while because I was previously a teacher so I've kind of done a lot of things to get to this point um but yeah so the engineering doctorate I managed to get through all my modules they're they're quite tough to get through but it's really re rewarding because I felt that it helped prepare me for my project so you have exams basically uh, every two weeks you have three days of lectures and then you have your exam and it's kind of like in a it's kind of like in a cycle and then after say about six seven months you're then introduced into the lab so from the get-go you're in the laboratory starting to get trained up on different techniques so for corrosion I study a lot on coatings and what we look at is is basically how a coating is able to resist corrosive conditions because with cars obviously we drive cars they're put under conditions where maybe there's a lot of um, salt in the atmosphere like we have at Swansea the cars also get damaged as well so those conditions can help break down coatings and expose the metals that our cars are made out of mm -hmm. so studying at Swansea I absolutely love it I'm, I'm from Swansea, so I actually returned back from London and Reading to come study for my engineering doctorate. And Swansea is highly regarded, highly regarded in terms of engineering, but particularly in terms of the engineering doctorate. There is a difference, and a lot of people ask me, what is an engineering doctorate? Well, the engineering doctorate, as I mentioned, is four years compared to a three-year PhD. You have additional modules which are academic like I explained but also you have different components in terms of mentioning about business and ethics and kind of things that you should be aware of before you join industry and the bonus is also is that you have an industrial partner which during a PhD if I would have studied that in chemistry I wouldn't have had that opportunity and Swansea is linked obviously to Tata and many other places uh, around the UK and for me in Europe I'm linked with BASF and as I mentioned before it's a German chemical company it's one of the biggest in the world so this engineering doctorate so far has given me a lot of opportunity if it wasn't for the m2a and swansea i've i'm hoping to moving on kind of in the future and in the next year when we are able to travel to go back to germany and go to basf and get some more hands-on experience within the labs and finishing my doctorate 
and kind of the future for me I have wondered what to do I, I I've come from a, a well a background of education so maybe lecturing would be something that I could consider because I do really enjoy teaching I do have a, a a large interest in kind of acting as a role model as well in terms of the STEM subjects I do enjoy being supportive as well but then I also am um, really enjoying research and just learning new things every day and just getting challenged they really do challenge you in the NGD you've got to be kind of on the ball all the time and I think that's so important it's more of a realistic kind of um it's, it's just more realistic than I think for me than the PhD because I'm working directly with my industrials so before this webinar I was talking to my industrials and my supervisors of Swansea for two hours and they just give you input and their personal ex you know their experience their experts in the field so they are at the forefront of industry as well so you're getting hands-on experience and you're kind of knowing what it's like in industry and I, I've had a really positive experience in terms of being in, inclus included in everything at Swansea and industry. So I feel that is a place where I could be and where I belong. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, can I quickly ask you with the NGD, have you got um, sort of a more balanced female, male student ratio or was it still male dominated? I mean, it's, it's, it depends on the year. So the, the years above me, well, particularly the, in the year whereas in my year in the third year there's quite a balance so I'd say there is a balance and I've never really felt like there was loads of males I say that, that there could be more females there isn't it isn't quite equal but yeah. it depends on the uptake I think mm -hmm. that we, nobody feels excluded being female or male applying for the NG and they are very inclusive in how you know they recruit everyone for the through the university and the M2A and I've helped out with that as well so they do make sure that they do put females at the forefront and do include us and to give you know our experience on it all and that's kind of what I'm trying to do yeah that's... in terms of the NG because I didn't really I didn't really know what an NG was before I just happened to be told by um one of the geography lecturers when the left she told me that there's a really good program going on in engineering and that I should apply for it. And I happen to know because I happen to know about the NG because of this person. So I think, yeah, it is important that we do have events like this. So people are aware of what is an NG and who is doing an NG rather than it just yeah. being in engineering. <laughs> and, it, and it's good to hear that in your year, there's more of a balance and hopefully that's going to, change in future years. Um, Meredith, do you want to tell us just a little bit about your experience as a maths graduate? Yeah, of course. So I always loved maths from when I was very little. Um, I was doing my times tables before I was saying my words. Um, mm -hmm. So I was always brought up being like, oh, I'm going to do something with maths. Um, from a very young age, I always wanted to be a maths teacher. And I did a level in... Um, did an A11 in maths and in my class it was actually predominantly men so I was very much brought up with it was more men that went into maths than women um all of my teachers in my school so not too long ago it was 2012 that I did my A levels and it was yeah it was mainly ma males and the teachers were all male I think I had one female maths teacher um and I always going back to like stereotypes because um, my common sense isn't always there. Um, people tend to think that I'm not clever or I'm not academic because I come out with maybe some silly things sometimes. Um, and people always assume that you're, wow. I always, I always had sort of a stereotype of, if I'd say, oh, I'm doing an A-level in maths, they'd be like, oh, really? Or I'm doing a maths degree. They'd be like, oh, really? You can do a maths degree? Like... I don't know, people just, yeah, it's going back to stereotypes and what Casey said of what a mathematician looks like. I certainly wouldn't be the picture of what they would think a mathematician would look like. Um, when I went to university, um, I had Elaine as one of my lecturers, um, Irina, who's another 
uh, inspirational maths lecture that I had. They were both, um, it was just nice to see, like there are quite a lot of male uh, lecturers in the department, um, but it was nice to see that there was female lecturers as well that you could go to. Um, but in university, I also did, um, I was an, an ambassador for math. So I was trying to encourage people to go onto the maths course. And again, the amount of people that I'd speak to and realizing that we weren't all like socially awkward. Um, they just have this vision of what you're supposed to be like. Um, so helping those people realize that it's such a diverse bunch of people that do study maths. In my cohort, I think it's about 30% women to 70% men. Um, but in my lectures, I honestly didn't notice the difference because actually it was the women that turned up and not the men. So it was about 50% women, 50% men in lectures. Um, and then I went on to study a PGCE and being in a school and trying to inspire the next generation to study maths because again, they all just think that it's, it's just breaking the stereotype. I think that's the main thing and, and being able to inspire them to move on. Um, so in terms of future career, obviously I'm studying for a PGC now and I'm gonna be a maths teacher next year. And in the school that I'm gonna be working in, it's actually 95% women. So as I said at the start, it was 95% men. Now in the school that I'm gonna be in, it's 95% women. Um, and I do want to return to studying further on in my career as well. So I want to go back and do a, um, a master's in statistics um, and move on to having more than one career. Because I don't think we just have to have one career. Um, I'd love to do both. Yeah, amazing. And, you know, we're, we're pinning our hopes on you to inspire the next generation of mathematicians, <laughs> aren't we, Elaine? <laughs> Thank you, Meredith. Um, I'm going to ask Rhiannon and Nathando now a little bit about what you've just said, Meredith. Meredith. Um, obviously, engineering, um, computer science, they're quite male dominated subjects, as we've talked about. Um, how have you found the balance and has it affected your studies in any way? So, Rhiannon, do you want to kick off? Yeah, so um, I decided to study engineering really similarly to how Patricia said in, when she spoke about her experiences. I really enjoyed like problem solving. I was quite inquisitive when I was in school. Um, I was quite good at like maths and sciences. But from my personal experience at school, for the girls who were very good at maths and science, they were pushed to study like medicine and those sort of subjects. And it was never actually advised like you could study engineering. I kind of had to do the research for myself. Um, and I was the only girl from my school that did any form of engineering, whether it be a degree or an apprenticeship or a job or anything. Wow. Um, and I remember when I told a lot of like my friends and my family members that I was going to be studying engineering and uh, specifically mechanical, the first thing they would say is, oh, do you want to be a mechanic? And I was like, it's not the same thing, like the same as has already been mentioned in terms of stereotypes that the, the first stereotype that comes out is mechanical engineering means you're going to be a mechanic and it just could not be further from what mechanical engineering actually is so I had to do a lot of my own research um, and then in terms of like the the girl to boy ratio it you know you can't deny it it is very male dominated even now um, I don't know the exact stats but I would say it's about 15 percent girls on the course maybe less um, and for me personally I did notice it at first I kind of walked into a lecture theater and you know looked around and I was like I'm the only girl in this room and there's probably like 80 boys in the room but I quite quickly got over it. Um, a couple of people have said to me in the past, like, you don't look like someone who would do engineering. And again, it's the stereotypes, like what does an engineering student look like? We're not all nerdy, antisocial people who just sit in the corner and read books and things. Um, and I just think that we really need to get past that stereotype. Obviously we are trying to encourage more girls to consider engineering, but I feel like the whole girls boys thing is very outdated anyway and it doesn't really matter if you are a girl or a boy because we're all the same anyway which is why I think for me personally I haven't been intimidated by the fact that sometimes I am the only girl because I personally don't look at it in that sense I don't notice it um I live on my own now with five boys in a student house and I notice it in terms of the messiness and you know the boyness of it but in terms of our studies we are completely on the same level playing field and 
it hasn't affected me in any of my experiences. I've been very, very fortunate that I haven't had some of the experiences that, say, Reem, for example, mentioned in terms of there not being facilities for girls. Um, I may come across that in future, but throughout my studies, Swansea University have been, you know, the most supportive. And I've currently, I've just accepted a graduate scheme with a company called Renishaw. Um, and it's a graduate scheme for me mechanical engineering, but specifically manufacturing. So kind of the more hands-on side of mechanical engineering. Um, and I've just been added to a social media group to meet the other graduates on my course. And I was pleasantly surprised that it's about 50-50 in terms of girls and boys, the split, which I was very, very surprised at. I think there's 12 of us on the scheme and there's six girls and six boys. Um, and I kind of told some of my friends about that and they were like, oh, you only got the job because you were a girl. And like, it's a joke, but it, that joke shouldn't be made because mm -hmm. yeah, they are trying to encourage more girls to do engineering and they are trying to bring more females into the industry, but we deserve, we earned the right to be there. I earned that job and I got that job, not because I'm a girl, but because of my abilities. And I think that's something that even in myself I need to you know we need to stop doubting ourselves I don't know if anyone else does but I sort of doubted myself and thought oh maybe I did just get that job because I'm a girl and they're trying to encourage more female engineers and things mm -hmm. um but yeah it's just I other than that that's the only time that I've ever experienced it but throughout my degree it's been you know it's just something that we kind of have to accept as girls and we have to prove ourselves and prove that we have earned the right to be in the um, industry that we're in. Yeah, well, congratulations on uh, on your graduate position. And it's good to hear that there's a nice gender balance. It seems from our discussion, there seems to be a sticking point uh, with younger pupils in school with stereotypes. Yeah. Uh, university yeah. seems to be quite balanced, although within lectures, obviously you're seeing more boys than girls in computer science and engineering. But then as you know, um, others on the panel have discussed when you're going on to your careers, you, there are support networks and you're feeling, you're not feeling that you've got it because you're just a woman. Yeah, but yeah pretty terrible for the friends to like laugh and joke and we, sh we shouldn't really be in that. Yeah. that it, it's a joke. I can take a joke, but I know other yeah. people maybe would not take it as a joke and it, it probably yeah. shouldn't be joked about in the first place. Yeah. No, probably not. <laughs> um, Nathando, do you want to tell us about your experiences? Yeah. Sure. Um, so I'm from Zimbabwe. Um, it's a country in Africa and I was in a boarding school with just girls. So um, I wasn't really, I mean, I was exposed to guys back at home when I went back for um, exit weekends or holidays. So um, I remember vividly, I think I was in my second year of high school. Um, I was taking up a, a subject called applied ICT. So they gave us a test and they said, okay, so if anyone gets above 98%, you guys can do computer science for the third year of high school. So it's like, okay, cool. So I got more than 98% and I really wanted to do computer science. But then unfortunately, there was only about 10 people who only got above 98%. So they didn't introduce computer science that year. And um, they never introduced it until I was in my... AS level so that's like the last just the last year before your A levels and um, it was really terrible so um, that kind of forced me to also do a, a foundation year so when I did my foundation year same as probably everyone else here we had a lot of guys compared to girls but I never really felt it I think I only noticed those things when other people point them out so I know obviously at the back of my head that there's a lot of guys and a few girls but it's not something that I'm constantly looking out for because I think um, the lecturers as well as um, a lot of people around the university make you feel welcome and like you belong there. So I, I haven't, I've never ever felt like, okay, so I'm being excluded from things because I'm a female. If anything, because I'm a female, I'm getting more support than, you know, the guys normally would. There are more activities and events for females than guys. Um, but yeah, I remember even when I applied for computer science, I told one of my teachers in high school that I'd been accepted to Sons University and she said to me, are you sure you're going to be able to do it? I don't think she doubted that I was smart. I think she doubted that I'm, I'm, I'm a female and am I going to be able to do that, you know, with a lot of guys. But um, I told I could do it. I, I'm doing it. <laughs> and yeah, yeah so, so yeah, I, I think... There's definitely the, the difference. I think there's, when I started, 
there was a uh, 10% females compared to guys. And um, even the guys, they're all very friendly. So it's not like guys are like the girls are just sitting on their, on their own and stuff. There's probably just over 300 students in my year, maybe a bit less now. Um, but yeah, maybe it's because when I go into the lecture rooms, I just go in and I sit in front. So I never really get to see anything that's behind me. <laughs> but, yeah, so I think the university really does a good job when it comes to supporting us and empowering us, helping us to get into the right industries. But even at work, because I'm, I'm on my placement at Lloyd's Banking Group, I've never felt the diff like the that there's, you know, the different gender roles, you know, more guys than girls and stuff. I even get more support from the senior management people with mainly guys, of course, but then there are a few females as well. So it's been really nice to feel, you know, like I belong there. Yeah. Wow, brilliant. What a story. Thank you for telling us. Um, and then it's great to have people like Casey, who is a lecturer now in computer science, who's going to be inspirational to female undergraduates that are joining us in the coming years. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left before we go to the Q&As. So I just wanted to touch on Athena Swan, um, which is a program that um, we run in uh, Swans University. And it's uh, a scheme that's run by the Equality Challenge Unit. And it recognizes advancement of gender equality within um, within our university, and I know Elaine and Casey, you're um, you've been part of Athena Swan um, for a while. I was just wondering if um, one of you could just briefly outline what it means to the university and why we're so invested in it. Yeah, so um, mathematics together with computer science. Um, so so um, Athena Swan has a number of different awards. Uh, which recognise um, commitment to advancing gender equality. And it was initially set up for STEM, uh, but now it's not just for STEM, it's across all academic subjects and even also for pro professional services. And there are a number of different awards which recognise different sort of levels of commitment um, at, at different stages. And so together with computer science, mathematics and computer science together applied uh, for a bronze award, which is the first level of award. And we received this last year in April 2020. So we were very pleased about that. And I was involved uh, in, the, in the preparation of the, of the application for this. And this was extremely informative and interesting actually. So we did a number of things. Uh, so we looked very closely at data. Uh, so we looked at you know, the number of uh, female students um, and male students, but um, all sorts of things in, in, you know, in, in different years. We looked at staff, we looked at promotions, um, we looked at you know, where there might be possible gender biases. Uh, we also had a number of very interesting discussion groups, both with students and with staff, to try to understand some of the issues. And uh, based on that, we put in an application uh, where we discussed the, the various things that we'd found. And you know, over the next few years, we're going to be implementing uh, our plan, basically, to try to um, you know, enhance uh, gender equality in maths and computer science. And you know, some of the things that we're doing, for example, you know, we run events like, um, in fact, the very last event we had before we went into lockdown last year uh, was an, an event that we ran for International Women's Day. Uh, where we had a number of uh, female alumni who came back and told us great stories. In fact, like some of the like some of the stories you've been hearing today about people who went on into industry or went in, on into various different kinds of careers. And so, I mean, Athena Swan is a great thing, and it allows us to um, investigate various different issues and um, to, you know to highlight uh, the importance of not just gender equality, but equality more generally. Excellent, thank you. Um, Patricia, are you involved in Athena Swan in engineering? Uh, yeah, so we do a lot of work with Athena Swan in engineering. We've got um, a women engineering uh, student group, which is really active, and they held a couple of events um, recently. It is good to have that network. So it forms a couple of purposes. One thing is it's, a membership group for staff and students who are interested in progressing conversations about this and making this um, you know, part of the work that we do at the university. 
and also we do a lot of um we do have like a fun a family fun day where staff and students can bring their kids along um to play together and talk informally and meet uh, we run recognition days where we talk about the work that women in engineering are doing um, we also run more and more we're doing more work on inclusivity so working with students working with staff to identify where people are using harmful language around stereotypes or where there are microaggressions um, that are affecting how people how well people, they feel they belong in engineering so that's a bit more interventionist and i think that's actually really quite powerful and really good work that's going on at the minute within the athena swan committee um, because i think this work is for everybody it's not just for women I think there's a lot of work for men here to do so the big focus on athena swan is is getting men to come with us and make those changes and we're lucky that our board has got a good split between males and females because it wouldn't work if it was all females it has to be a mix of both yeah <coughs> so good to get the point of view from the male perspective as well and that's brilliant and of course we're we're aiming for gold aren't we in our athena swan awards um so yeah fantastic I can see that there have been a couple of Q and A's, a couple of questions, and um, I think they've been answered. So I don't know if any um, anybody on the call wants to put anything in the Q and A, um, and our panelists can answer them. If there's anything extra, we'll give it a, a minute or so because this bit's kind of the chance for people to start typing. Hopefully, there'll be some questions. I'd like to add on to the last question that was answered. So have you found, because companies are trying to strive gender equality, that it is an advantage as a female? Um, so when I first applied for my graduate position, I never thought that being a female would give me any advantage. Um, I was offered a few graduate positions. Um, I got all the ones that I applied for, which was great. And it was actually my partner that said, oh, it might be because you're a female. And it really hurt. And I don't think anyone realized how much it hurt because um, as uh, somebody who just graduated, I actually had the highest mark in my cohort, which I kind of hold that as a, as a flag. Like I am capable of doing my work. Thank you very much. Um, and yeah, it really hurt. And for somebody so close to me to say it, but he was like, no, I, he meant it. So he's actually working in construction. So Reen, he's probably one of the blokes on site. <laughs> um, and he said, we find that in construction, that if there's a female, um, they're kind of held on a pedestal because they're the only female and they'd like to get more females into the construction industry. So he's worked with several female apprentices who have been taken on mostly within construction or sometimes in construction because they're female. So he felt like it must be the same for my industry. And I said, absolutely not. I've earned every single position that I've applied for. Um, so I think perhaps sometimes it can be considered as an advantage in somebody else's perspective, but you've just got to have it right in your mindset. As Elaine said, be confident. And as Rhiannon said, with what you are capable of, like my marks have more than proved what I can do. And I will continue to prove that I am worthy of any position I own and it's not because I'm a female yeah absolutely yeah if I can well said. add to that um I think what we're talking about here happens in quite a lot of uh places or cultures or um and it's tokenism which is that's the name right um mm -hmm. and that happens everywhere um anywhere that there's a minority that could be uh, the case right and in in, in our case in in stem the minority is women or or at least for the time being it's getting better obviously um as going back to what patricia said it's, it is true that uh without the help of men we're not going to go very far <laughs> we're not going to go very far so it's it's a sort of culture change as well that needs to uh, that we need to advance um and i'm not surprised that he is in construction, <laughs> actually. Uh, but I have to say that in that first job, there were 744 applicants for two positions. And when they were about 25, because we had uh, on top of that in the selection process, we had a group um, 
sort of exercise kind of dynamic or whatever they call it. And in that group dynamic, maybe there was maybe 40%, you know, 40, 60, uh, the, that would be the ratio I would say. So I don't know about apprenticeships, but I know for a fact that to get into it, there was a lot of competition and it was fierce and there was a lot of people and there were only two positions and they did look at a lot of things, right? Um, but yes, it, it's totally, totally agree that um, the first thing that comes to mind is, oh, well, we needed to get our, you know, we want our board to look better or our company to look good or now it's very fashionable to have, you know, we're inclusive and all these, all these words, right? So mm-hmm. I think there needs to be a sort of really radical kind of culture change and, and the foundations of it rather than just, and the microaggressions, like you say, is, is, is that's definitely a microaggression or macro in this case. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, Right, I'm going to whiz through some of these questions. Um, Are there any grants, scholarships for women in STEM for undergraduates? Not that I'm aware of. Um, It may be something other universities have, but uh, to be honest, I'm I'm not really aware of any of those. So apologies for that, Caroline. Um, I'm currently in year 12. What is the best advice in choosing a degree and career path, as will be dropping our subjects soon. I think that goes pretty much back to Patricia when she introduced herself and talked about um, curiosity and enjoying subjects. And I think the best advice is to follow the subjects that you enjoy the most, um, because then once you've got that enjoyment, you'll find studying that subject much easier. Um, Can I come uh, in there, Rianne, as well? Yeah, because the only real prerequisite we have is maths. And you can, as long as you're coming in with maths, you can do any combination of other subjects. And actually, we find that the students who come in with, say, English, physics, maths or something make really good engineers because an engineer is a lot of report writing. So don't be too misled. Don't be too led by you have to do sciences and maths. You can be quite broad. Geography is great. History is great. All of those. You'll get skills from those degrees that are really important for engineering. But you must also have maths. Brilliant. And there's uh, one question here that says, how can we stand out? Who wants to take that one? Oh, uh, oh I think someone said they will. No, no, Thando, go for it. How can we stand out? Yeah, I've been looking at that question a lot because I've gone through something similar even at work where um, I think when it comes to university and any really um, maybe work experience that you want to get during university, it's up to you to make it what you want it to be. So there's only so much that the university can do for you. The rest is up to you. So be it being an ambassador for the university or for your course, go for it. If there's um, maybe maybe even an opportunity like this, go for it. Because I think anything that gets you noticed by people or gets your name out to the rest of the department really helps you out, even when you're looking for like jobs later on in the future. Um, I when I when I started in my foundation year, I I just there, there was um I wouldn't call it like a role, but like it was to be a student about student rep, sorry, for the course. And I didn't know anything about it, but I was just like, I'm gonna go for it. Um, I wasn't a very confident person back then, but I went for it. And um Monica, um, the head of department, I think program director rather, she was very helpful. And um, so if even if you're afraid that you're not gonna be good at something, just try to get as much help as you can from other people, but still go for it. So yeah, just grab whatever chances you can with both hands. (laughs) Brilliant. Anyone else want to add into how we can stand out? Can I just say, be yourself? Yeah. I think think sometimes people feel they should be something else and people just really stand out by being themselves. Yep. Be yourself, be true to yourself be confident, have a go at everything, believe in yourself. You all deserve the same opportunities as everybody else. And neatly that's taken us to six o'clock. So I just want to say thank you all to to our panel of 
really inspirational women. Um, I've learned loads and totally inspired. And I hope for everybody watching, uh, you also have taken away some inspirational stories and it's going to um, give you uh, the, I don't know, the chance or the, you know, to really pursue your uh, dreams and career goals. So thank you so much, everybody, and uh, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you all.